Sorry about that. I wanted to start recording. All right, so there's three components. We have are what we call traditionally innate defenses. They react the same way. They don't remember. They tend to be nonspecific. Then we have our specific immunity, adaptive immunity that we'll talk about next week. Uh, uh, good example, that's getting a vaccine. Your body remembers your com certain components of your immune system, remember it and can mount a more vigorous response the next time. And then our last uh, lecture on immunology are some of the things that just go wrong, um, immunological disorders. So we'll talk about the three lines of host defenses, uh, some components of the first line of defense, also the role the normal biota plays as a first line defense mechanism. Host defenses are first line of defenses or just barriers that block invasion at portals of entry. Our mouth, our eyes, or nose, what, what do we have there that helps us? This line of defense does not involve recognition of foreign substances. It is very general in action. Our next line is nonspecific. Uh, we have internalized system of protective cells or immune cells, and also inflammation and phagocytosis, which is part of the um, protective cells, inflammation itself helps to uh, provide a non-specific response. Third line of defense is acquired on individual basis as each foreign substance is encountered. This is more the uh, memory response. Reaction with a microbe produces unique protective substances and cells can come into play if the microbes encountered again. This is the part, this third line is what we call our adaptive or acquired immunity. It is long-term immunity. So here's a breakdown of that. Our first line of defense consists of physical and chemical barriers. We'll talk about that. The second line, phagocytosis, inflammation, fever, antimicrobial proteins that cells uh, release. And then our third, this is the third, this is one that is very specific. It takes a while to activate it. So for example, when you get a vaccine, like an hour later, you're not immune, it takes a while for that acquired immunity to build up. And that third line of defense involves our immune cells called B cells and T cells. These are the only cells your immune system that can develop memory cells. The B cells are the only cells that make antibodies. And there's several different types of T cells that play an important role and we'll talk about those uh, different types of T cells. So our primary physical and chemical barriers, uh, the body oils that we have, our tears have an enzyme in them called lysozyme, which breaks down the cell wall of bacteria. The mucus traps things and we cough or sneeze them out. Our saliva also has lysozyme in it. We have the cilia and along the respiratory here that uh, helps to uh, move things up and out. We have mucus secretions that trap microbes, our sweat, low pH of our skin. Our stomach is very acidic, pH two. And a low pH serves to oxidize. If you remember, that's the removal of energy, breaks things down. We have enzymes in our intestine, digestive enzymes that can also act as microbes. And also we have mucus. Defecation and urination can expel things from our system. And our skin is a very good barrier. It's actually uh, 
had anatomy, it's uh, four barriers. Our outer layer skin constantly sloughs off. I'm just checking to see if there's anybody I need to put admit. I don't have any new people. So our skin, epithelia, they're well, it's well compacted, cemented together, and has a, a protein called keratin, <clears throat> which is provides for a very uh, non-specific but uh, resilient barrier, the thick, tough layer, it's highly impervious and waterproof. Few pathogens can penetrate unless the skin is broken. Hair follicles, the hair shaft periodically extrude, follicle cells desquamate. Uh, also our sweat glands offers a flushing activity to help remove microbes. The mucous membranes of our digestive, urinary, and respiratory tract in of the eye are, are moist and permeable. They provide a, uh, a barrier without keratinized uh, out that the skin has. The mucous coat impedes the entry and attachment of bacteria. Blinking and tear production rid the eyes of irritants. Saliva carries uh, the microbes to harsh conditions of the stomach. As I said before, pH two, the stomach is very acidic. Nasal hairs trap larger particles. This is um, talking about the respiratory tract, copious flow of mucus and fluids during allergy and colds exerts a flushing action. The beating of the cilia helps to move it up and out. The ciliated epithelium moves the foreign particles trapped in mucus toward the pharynx, which is uh, basically we're talking about coughing or sneezing. The genital urinary tract is protection, continuous trickle of urine through uh, urethas and bladder emptying that flushes the urethra. Vaginal secretions provides cleansing of the lower reproductive tract. Resident microbiota <clears throat> that we have on us and in us also help in our uh, innate defenses. They are antagonistic to other microbes. They block access to sites that pathogens could bind on epithelial surfaces. They will even create an unfavorable uh, environment for other pathogens. They compete for nutrients and they can alter the local pH. Non-specific chemical defenses, the skin and mucous membranes, sebaceous secretions exert an antimicrobial effect. <clears throat> we already mentioned lysozyme that is found in tears and saliva breaks down the cell wall of bacteria. The lactic acid and electrolyte concentrations in uh, sweat are not a favorable environment to a lot of microbes. The skin uh, has an acidic pH and uh, fatty acid content that can be inhibitory to microbes. We already mentioned <clears throat> the stomach. The acid is hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Our intestines have uh, digestive juices, the bile that is secreted emulsifies fats. Semen has antimicrobial chemicals and the vagina has a protective acidic pH that's maintained by the normal biota. So the skin produces what to create a waterproof barrier to microbes. Is it keratin? Yeah, keratin plays an important role in that. It's very, uh, skin's very uh, thick and also tightly bound together. A thick layer of what in the nasal and respiratory tract uh, traps bacteria. Is it mucus? Yes, the mucus. Blank and blank creates unfavorable environment for pathogens by 
competing for nutrients and altering the pH. That's our normal microbiota. Tears in saliva contain what that hydrolyzes the peptic lichen layer, bacterial cell walls. That's the lysozyme. Yeah, the lysozyme. Lysozyme, I'm sorry. Yep, that's good. Uh, the low pH in the blank and blank prevents the growth of microbes. Is that the skin and a digestive tract? Yeah, particularly this, the stomach. Um, stomach. The stomach is very uh, low pH. So we're gonna talk next about the second and third lines of defense. Uh, we're gonna talk about a marker and its importance in the second and third lines of defense. Now, in the study of these uh, next lines of defense involving the immune cells, uh, it all, they also play an important role in cancer and allergy, as we will see. And what, what's important in the immune system, in these immune cells, they have to recognize self versus non-self. So sometimes you'll, you'll hear the term a self antigen, like usually we think of antigens as something foreign uh, that the immune system reacts to, and that is true. And that's the classical uh, definition of an antigen. And, but we also have markers on our cells that so that when the immune system comes in contact with them, they don't react to. So this first one is showing you a white blood cell coming in contact with some other cell. And they recognize that, that there's, they're recognizing the normal self antigens. So there's no immune reaction. Uh, down here, it's showing you again a white blood cell coming in contact with bacteria, PMA's pattern, uh, antigen, uh, I forgot what it is, but the uh, markers on the bacteria register as being foreign. Pa I'm sorry, here's the definition, pa pathogen recognition receptor that the white blood cell recognizes these foreign proteins. So if this is a phagocytic cell, what it does is it engulfs the bacteria and breaks it down. Now this doesn't involve an immune memory response, but it does involve recognizing self from non-self. And uh, it's fairly specific in, in the one sense that it's recognizing something as being foreign. But this uh, phagocytic cell will not have any memory of this. White blood cells move throughout the body searching for pathogens. They are trained Professor. to recognize self. Professor. Yes. I'm sorry, but quick question. So you said the immune system can recognize self cells um, in this right. one. And then the second one, once it recognizes the foreign cell and it destroys it, do it have some memory of that cell? Yeah. Of the <clears throat> yes, that's what I was uh, trying to explain. No, it, it doesn't. It, it This part of our immune system, what we classically called the innate immune system, <laughs> reacts the same way and with the same intensity each time, but it does not involve any memory. Okay. okay. The, only, the only part of our immune system that has memory are those B cells and T cells that we'll talk right. That's the only one. So like if you get a vaccine, the B and T cells come into contact with it and they remember the vaccine so that when you actually get <clears throat> exposed to that, like say your flu vaccine, when you get actually exposed to the virus, <clears throat> your body actually not only remembers it, but it, but it mounts a more robust uh, immune response. Okay. 
Okay. So, and we've probably heard right now with the COVID, there are two promising vaccines. They are unique in that they are what are called RNA vaccines. They use the message RNA of the virus. Okay. And one of them um, had a, uh, these are large, uh, what we call phase three trials in which thousands of people got the vaccine. They either got the SIBO or they uh, got the actual vaccine. In the one group, the Moderna uh, vaccine, 95 people out of 30 some thousand people got COVID. But of that group, 90 of the people got placebo. So only five people who had gotten the actual vaccine, not the placebo, got infected. The other interesting thing is 11 people got seriously inf uh, sick, but all of those people were people who only got the placebo. Oh, wow. So we, so we do seem to be rounding a corner. Um, the government a while back said when we start getting to this point, they will just start making a ton of vaccines. If for some weird reason it doesn't pan out, even though we spent time and money, those vaccines will be gotten rid of and we'll move on. But uh, both these two RNA vaccines that are the Pfizer and the Moderna seem, certainly seem promising. Are they making it mandatory now or? The vaccines basically can, can, can't really be mandatory except for a job. A, a job oh, yeah, that's for, my job makes it mandatory. <laughs> yes, but the government as a whole, I don't think really has a mechanism to do that. Unfortunately, some people might choose not to get it, but the important point is that most people get it and we get hopefully herd immunity and it'll stop the spread. Once we stop the spread, hopefully the virus will um, die out. Okay, thank you. Sure. So back to these markers, the molecules on the surface of cells, they're composed of proteins and or sugars and the immune system evaluates them. In other words, makes a determination, are they self or non-self? Uh, another interesting thing about, you usually think of antigens of being uh, you know, like the bacteria and the viruses, self antigen being markers on our cells that the immune system recognizes self. There's something else you might hear the term neoantigens. And this happens when a cell becomes cancerous. Cancer is mainly a uh, mutation in the DNA the DNA is mutated, it's going to make an abnormal protein. When it expresses the protein on its surface, it's called a neoantigen. And our immune system will also recognize that as foreign and will attempt to get rid of the abnormal or the cancerous cell. And it's also the basis of new uh, immune therapies to fight cancer. Okay. <clears throat> What are the three responsibilities of a healthy immune system? <laughs> did we uh, did we talk about that? I don't, the three responsibilities of a healthy immune system. Um, good question. Anybody have some ideas? Is one surveillance of the body? Correct. That's a very, that's a very good answer. The, the immune system surveils the body for foreign microbes, and it also surveils our body. Um, I just sort of mentioned this uh, to look for abnormal cells, cells that are becoming cancerous, and it'll it'll uh, eliminate those cells also. And destruction of that foreign body. Yes, and. Um, that we have the uh, both the innate immunity and then we have the other part of our immunity which we call the acquired or adaptive immunity so true or false cells marked as self are not marked for destruction by the immune system 
Uh, that is no, that is true. So cells that are that have a something on them that identifies them as self, those but, are, are not attacked by our immune system. Right, but it's it's got to be recognized as self first. Cells marked as self are not marked for destruction by the immune system. That is true. Did I not say that right or read it right? I think, no, I, I don't know. I thought it, if, if it, you, it, it, it react. Like, like if you, um, if you have a certain blood type, mm -hmm. A positive, and they accidentally gave you B, your immune system still recognizes the A positive blood cells. But if you got the wrong blood type, it's going to recognize those as non-self and will attack them. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So these markers or what we call self antigen or markers on all our cells, like you might have heard of major histocompatibility proteins that are on our cells. These are self antigens or markers. So if somebody gets an organ transplant, they look to see how much of a match those major histocompatibility are, proteins are to the donor organ. And, and then that coupled with immune suppressive drugs helps the person get the organ transplant. So these markers are composed of proteins. Sometimes they have sugars on them called glycoproteins or sugars. True or false, non-self non cells such as food or commensal organism are, are attacked by the immune system. That's a little tricky. So the food we consume actually gets broken down and digested. Uh, commensal organisms, uh, that is uh, what our normal biota is. Basically, we're, our, our immune system sort of lives in a truce with them, tolerating their presence. And um, otherwise, we'd be in trouble if our immune system was constantly attacking, for, uh, for example, all the bacteria that live in our, our gut. Systems involved in immune defense, four body compartments that participate in immunity we'll talk about, components of the mononuclear phagocytic system, structures and functions of our lymphatic system plays an important role. We'll talk about the whole blood, plasma, and serum. We'll talk about six types of blood cells that function in nonspecific immunity. And we'll describe the major role of the T and B lymphocytes. So we're going to talk about these different immune cells that are part of what we call innate immunity. And then our acquired or adaptive immunity are just the T and B cells. The B cells are the only cells in our body that's responsible for making antibodies. Though so they can make them as part of the innate immunity but they can also develop uh, memory of the antigen, several different kinds of T cells. We'll talk about their role. So body compartments that participate in the immune function, phagocytic uh, system. We have a couple different kinds of phagocytic cells. The spaces surrounding tissues uh, that contain the extracellular fluid our bloodstream, immune cells circulate in it, and our lymphatic system also has immune cells in it. So if you were looking at cells in contact with the reticular cells and the extracellular fluid, so for example, we have a blood vessel here blood capillary, 
tissue cells, we have the extracellular matrix, we have fluid in between that. This is a type of immune cell called a dendritic cell. It's a type of phagocytic cell, very similar to macrophage. Uh, this is connective tissues in between. The flow of events depends where infectious agent or foreign substances first intrude. So a typical progression, extracellular spaces and the reticular tissues. And then in, uh, the immune response then involves lymphatic circulation and the bloodstream. So the phagocytic system, we have a network of connective tissue fibers and the cells and within that we have uh, different these are actually showing you several different kinds of phagocytic cells neutrophils they're the first to arrive at a site of infection the macrophages circulate in our system as monocytes they arrive later at the site of infection the dendritic cell is a very specialized macrophage it's involved in adaptive immune response, presenting the antigen to the B and T cells, um, sorry, to the T cells. The reticular system, which originates in the basal lamina area, interconnects nearby cells. It mes uh, meshes with a massive connective tissue surrounding all our organs. So lymphoid tissues in our, uh, our gut, our uh, digestive tract, we have an area, what we call the associated lymphoid tissue or GALT. It has immune cells. <clears throat> we also have in throughout the mucosal layer, also some lymphoid tissue and with immune cells. So for example, our digestive tract, respiratory tract, all has immune cells, our gut, digestive tract, as I said. The major functions are lymph, uh, lymphophatic, <laughs> lymphophatic, I don't know why I have trouble with that system. Uh, not all of this uh, has to do with, um, with immunity, but most of it does. First of all, uh, Extracellular fluid is returned to the circulatory system by the lymphatic system. It acts as a drain off for uh, when the uh, inflammation occurs, flu uh, fluid buildup occurs at the site of inflammation called edema. The immune cells and lymphatic system render surveillance, recognition, protection. It's made up of lymphocytes, phagocytes, and antibodies secreted by the B cells. The lymph fluid itself is a plasma-like liquid carried by lymphatic circulation. It's made up of water, salts, and about two to five percent. Uh, I just want to mute this. Numerous, uh, <clears throat> it, uh, the lymph system transport numerous white blood cells. It also transports fat, cellular debris. So that occurs at the site of inflammation when the phagocytic cells are breaking down the invading microbes. And also uh, some of the white blood cells die in the process. So that is why in the case of infection, doctors will uh, look for swollen lymph nodes, and that can also happen in the case of cancer. So lymphatic vessels are permeate all parts of our body. Thin walls are easily perme permeated by the extracellular area that is escaped from the circulatory system. Two differences between our bloodstream and lymphatic, the lymph moves in one direction only. It moves from the extremities 
to the heart and there's a sort of a pumping action involved. Lymph is only transported through the contraction of our skeletal muscles. So moving, walking, everything that helps to move the lymph. As you know, our blood our, uh, is in our uh, venous system, artery system, it's uh, moved by the uh, pumping of the heart. And it is also a closed and closed system. So the circulatory and lymphatic system, we mentioned before some of this, uh, it's throughout the body. And we have various areas, a cluster of these nodes. We have the galt and the uh, in our GI tract area. We also have some important lymph, uh, lymph, lymphatic organs, the very important ones, the thymus, and this is what T cells develop in. The B cells develop in our bone marrow and also in this galt, which has got associated lymphoid tissue. As you see, our circulatory system is a closed system. Arteries carry the blood away. Vein, venous carries the deoxygenated blood back. So organs and tissues that perform lymphatic functions, we mentioned the thymus, that this is where our um, T cells come from. We have the lymph nodes in different areas. The spleen has a lot of immune cells in it. Uh, a loose connection of tissue framework that houses an aggregate of lymphocytes is part of the uh, lymphoid system. Mentioned before, your thymus is the site of T cell maturation. It's a small triangular structure, uh, actually up, up here, largest it is largest proportionally at birth. It exhibits high rates of growth and activity until about puberty. It gradually sh shrinks throughout adulthood. Uh, though the T cells it makes uh, stay around with us, the, uh, the thymus itself becomes more, it shrinks and becomes more uh, fatty as we get older. The lymph nodes are small encapsulated bean-shaped organs. Uh, we have them in different areas, our neck, under our arms, our legs. These are areas, uh, clusters along lymphatic channels, the loose connection of the armpit, groin, and neck, and they help filter materials that have entered the lymphatic system. It's rich in immune cells. Spleen is another lymphatic organ, uh, upper left portion of the abdominal cavity. It serves as a filter for the blood instead of lymph. Its primary function is to remove worn out red blood cells from circulation. If you remember, your red blood cells don't last forever. Uh, by the way, what cell in our body does not have a nucleus? Does anybody know what cell in our body does not have a nucleus? Nope. It, uh, red blood cells, They uh, once they're created, the nucleus is removed. Immunological function. The spleen, it filters pathogens from the blood for phagocytosis by macrophages. Uh, miscellaneous lymphoid tissues, bundle of lymphocytes beneath the mucosa of our gastrointestinal respiratory tract, such as tonsils, the breasts of pregnant, lactating women. We mentioned the galt, the malt. I don't think we mentioned what the, the salt and balt are. Uh, these are uh, various associated lymphoid tissues. In our digestive tract, <clears throat> our test testing, we have these little areas called virus patches that have immune cells that can engage uh, 
foreign microbes as they move through our digestive tract. The composition of whole blood. So it actually has several components. A plasma component, <clears throat> which if you took the red blood cells and centrifuge them down the whole blood, you would have an area, what we call the plasma. Up here, you'd have the sera. The sera is the same as plasma, except it contains no clotting factors, this part. And the serum is all, often used in immune testing and immune therapy. So clotted whole blood would look like this with the serum up here, the unclotted, you'd centrifuge down, you get this buffy coat, and then you get the plasma. Components of plasma, there's hundreds of different chemicals produced by the liver, white blood cells, endocrine glands, nervous system. It's mostly water. It has proteins like albumin, globulin, contains antibodies and other immune chemicals, clotting factors, hormones, and nutrients, such as glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, various important ions. Dissolved gases, oxygen, CO2 are in the plasma, as are the waste products, urea. Production of blood cells begins in early embryonic development in the yolk sac. It is taken over by the liver and lymphoid organs, assumably assumed permanently in the red bone marrow the making of the red blood cells and also a place where B cells are made. Stem cells are a precursor of blood cells. Uh, stem, stem cells throughout our body, not just in relationship to this, but they're undifferentiated cells. Uh, in our uh, bone marrow, these undifferentiated or immune immature, I'm sorry, in specialized cells can develop and become mature cells. So for example, in the development, hemopoietic stem cell can become a stem cell that then can give rise over here to blood cells and platelets. Importantly for our immune system, it then becomes another cell called a myoblast that then becomes important immune cells, neutrophils, which is a phagocytic cell. They're first to arrive at the site of infection. Basophils, and also there's another one called macrophages. They play an important role in inflammation and allergies. Xenophils, another type of immune uh, cell involved in fighting worm uh, infections and also involved in inflammation. The stem cell up here becomes, can become a monocyte, which then can become a macrophage or a very specialized macrophage, a dendritic cell, which plays an important role in adaptive immunity. Also the hemopoietic stem cell can differentiate to lymphoid. That lymphoid cell can then eventually become what are called our B and T cells, which are the cells involved in uh, the memory response. T cells can also become what are called natural killer or cytotoxic T cells and uh, a specialized uh, T cell here. There's another kind of lymphocyte it doesn't have memory, it's called a natural killer cell. It has a very similar function to the cytotoxic T cell. Uh, they mainly attack cells that have been uh, infected with a virus and they also get rid of uh, abnormal cells. So, <clears throat> It's eight o'clock. Let's take a break just for a couple of minutes and then we will continue.
Uh, where are we at? We're on, I think, slide 40. All right, so <clears throat> we'll talk about uh, white blood cells, uh, also called leukocytes, and these are, are part of our important part of our immune system. They can be differentiated by various hemological stains. They appear with uh, with or without colored granulars, granules that you see in the cytoplasm. So they're divided in two groups. The granulocytes have a lobed nucleus and then what are called the agranulocytes that have an unlobed rounded nucleus. So the granulocytes are neutrophils, xenophils, and basophils. So neutrophils are a phagocytic cell first to arrive at the site of infection. The xenophils play an important role in inflammation fighting parasitic infections, basophils, and also mast cells play a role in inflammation and um, in allergies. <clears throat> so these granules that you see when you stain these cells, they function, uh, they're actually involved in various physiological phenomena. So basophils and mast cells, when you stain them and you see these granules, a lot of that is actually histamine. They have a lot of histamine in them. So neutrophils, uh, xenophils, basophils, neutrophils, anywhere from half to 90% of circulating leukocytes are neutrophils. They can also involve the production of toxic chemicals and the neutrophils are, play an important role in phagocytosis. The xenophils, the, the granules that you see in their cytoplasm are various enzymes, toxic proteins and inflammatory chemicals to play a role in uh, defense against microbes. They can attack and destroy large eukaryotic pathogens. So the xenophils play an important role in fighting parasitic infections. The basophils, they are very small, uh, percent of the circulating white blood cells. They are very similar to uh, another cell that I keep mentioning, mast cells, play an important role there. They have a lot of histamine, play an important role in allergies. The granulocytes, <clears throat> they don't have these, uh, all these different uh, compounds in their cytoplasm. They are the lymphocytes, the B and T cells, and the monocytes. So the monocytes uh, travel throughout our circulation. When they arrive to a site of infection, they become these large phagocytic cells called macrophages. Uh, Lymphocytes, they're the cornerstone of uh, the third line of defense. So that is the B and T cells we've been talking about. This is the only part of the immune system that can develop memory and encounter antigens and remember them. 
about 20, 35% of our white blood cells are lymphocytes. Uh, they are exceeded only by red blood cells and fibroblasts. So the main components are B and T cells, T cells from the thymus. The B cells are developed in the bone marrow or that gut associated lymphoid tissue. So lymphocytes, uh, they're the only cell, the B cells, sorry, are the only lymphocyte and the only cell that makes antibodies. This is also referred to as humoral immunity. Once the B cell makes, starts making the antibody, it becomes these large, what we call plasma cells that produce antibodies. The antibodies can do various things, but uh, uh, binding to antigens. Uh, then there's the T cells, and they have a wide spectrum of immune functions. They modulate immune functions and kill foreign cells. The action of both cell types accounts for our recognition and memory of what we call the acquired or adaptive immunity. The monocytes uh, are the ones that travel throughout the circulation. They have a cytoplasm that has digestive enzymes. They are discharged by our bone marrow into the bloodstream. They become the macrophages. They are long-lived. They're able to multiply. They're a very uh, versatile and important part of the phagocytic system. Macrophages can have both specific and nonspecific killing functions. They're a cellular house keep, uh, keeping. They, uh, they clean up the mess created by inflammation, infection, damaged tissue, uh, debris left over, processing foreign molecules. Though this is part of the adaptive immunity, though the macrophages themselves don't have memory, they play an important role in the encounter a foreign molecule, they then present it to the T cells. And then the T cells become activated and they activate the B cells. They can secrete uh, chemical messengers that mediate, attract, or inhibit immune cells. A specialized a specialized uh, immune cell uh, phagocytic cells called the dendritic cell. They are not a nerve cell. They just, because of these, whoops, where did we go? Because of these long protrusions that you see, people thought initially they were a nerve cell, but they're a specialized phagocytic cell. They ingest bacteria and viruses in, in uh, and stimulates them to move to the lymph nodes. They mature into highly effective processors and presenters of the foreign proteins to the T cells. Our blood cells, erythrocytes, simple bonkey, bioconcave sacs of hemoglobin. I'm sorry, hemoglobin that transports oxygen and carbon dioxide to and from tissues. Most numerous of all the circulating cells, they do not have an immune function. We also have a platelets who are actually fragments. They are not whole cells and they function in hemostasis, plugging uh, broken blood vessels, releasing chemicals that involved in clotting inflammation. So as far as the immune system is concerned, we won't be uh, talking about these cells. Well, the erythrocytes are a true cell, not the platelets, but. So the mononuclear phagocytic system are those neutrophils. Uh, true and false, the, uh, the lymph is propelled, lymph is propelled through the body by the action of smooth muscles. No, that is chemical mus muscles. Smooth muscles line your blood vessels. And then you have cardiac muscle, three types of muscle, if I remember correctly. Uh, 
phagocytosis process worn out red blood cells. I'm sorry, the, uh, the spleen process worn out blood cells and filters pathogens from the blood. So the following immune cells. So the neutrophils, again, they are one of the three types of phagocytic cells that we talked about. They also can release destructive chemicals. We have then the eosinophils play an important role in allergy and fighting parasitic infections. The T lymphocytes, we haven't uh, fully got to that yet, but there are several different types. They are part of acquired immunity. They can both stimulate and suppress the immune response. The B lymphocytes is the only type of cell that makes antibodies. And as we'll see, makes five different types of antibodies. The second line of defense, the major categories of nonspecific immunity, we're kind of jumping back, summarizes the steps in phagos, we're going to talk about the steps in phagocytosis, the role of the, the PAMs in this process. These are the foreign antigens. We're going to talk about the steps in inflammation, the mechanism of inflammation and uh, fever it plays an important role in our nonspecific immunity. We're going to talk also about a, uh, a series of proteins made by the liver called complement and complement proteins play an important role in our innate uh, defenses, uh, does three important things. We're also gonna talk about some uh, other antimicrobial proteins that our body has. So the general activity of, so we're at, Phagocytes to survey tissue compartments, discover microbes, particulate matter, or remove injured or dead cells. They uh, digest and eliminate these materials. They recognize immunological information, in other words, antigens in foreign matter. The neutrophils react early in the inflammatory response, foreign materials and damaged tissue. Common sign of a bacterial infection is a high neutrophil count. The xenophils are attracted to sites of parasitic infection. They play a minor phagocytic role in antigen antibody reactions. So they're very, you know, my, uh, slightly phagocytic. So we've talked before about the monocytes or transformed to macrophages after leaving the bloodstream and arriving to the site of inflammation. So the monocytes travel in the circulation and they can leave a blood vessel by something called um, diapedesis, which is the movement through the endothelial cells of the blood vessels. They uh, have destructive enzymes, a compartment called a lysosome with destructive enzymes when they phagocytize uh, a foreign uh, microbe. <clears throat> we have uh, various specialized mac macrophages in our lung cells, our liver cells, uh, cup fur cells are specialized that are found just in the liver. Uh, Langerham's dendritic cells, another specialized cell found in the underlayer of our skin. A histotype site is a specialized macrophage that can mi uh, migrate to certain tissue. So these are all macrophages and they're just specialized by where they're found, the lung, liver, the skin. There's macrophages in the spleen, bone marrow, kidney, bone. Uh, the, we even have them in the brain. So the phases, the first phase is coming to contact and you have these pattern recognition receptors. 
on a host cell. And so the uh, phagocytic cells has to recognize these as not being self. And they will then engulf them in a phagosome. And then what happens is the phagosome merges with something called lysosomes that have destructive chemicals. And the destructive chemicals breaks down the bacteria and it's expelled. Now, the interesting thing about this, if they engulf tuberculosis bacterium, the tuberculosis bacterium at this phase can secrete chemicals that inhibit the, this lysosome from fusing to the phagosome. And that's how they evade being broken down and they can even replicate inside there. So pathogen associate molecular patterns, they're found on bacteria. These are recognized by phagocytes and other immune cells. They serve as signal molecule on the surface of microbes. These type of patterns are not present in mammals. So this is what our body, these patterns associate molecular patterns, pathogen, I'm sorry, associate molecular path, patterns. This is what our body recognizes as being foreign. Some examples of that, peptoglycan that makes up the cell wall, the lipopolysaccharide makes up the LPS layer gram negative bacteria and also double-stranded RNA viruses are recognized. So our immune cells <clears throat> mainly have pattern recognition receptors for foreign antigens. They are, but we also have these on our endothelial cells. Um, but our white blood cells and the phagocytic cells have these molecules. They will recognize and bind to these pattern uh, associated molecular pattern receptors. Oops, sorry, I jumped around there. Found on the surface at all times, regardless of whether they've encountered an antigen or not. So we always have these pattern recognition receptors on our immune cell. That's how they surveil our system for antigens. We also have something, a type of pattern recognition receptor called toll-like receptors. There's different kinds. If you think of this as like a, like a gateway, it has two parts to it. And when it uh, recognizes a foreign molecule, it closes, stimulates our uh, DNA to then start the synthesis of various messengers, cytokines, interleukins, inflammatory mediators that signal other cells. So this is a one type of toll receptor found on macrophages. They're found on other cells. Lysosomes migrate to the scene of the phagosome. We already mentioned that process. They have a lot of antimicrobial chemicals that fuse with the phagosome and destroy the ingested material. A phagocytic cell can cause death of a bacteria within about 30 minutes. It's a very oxygenated series of uh, ions and free radicals in the, in the uh, lysosome, lactic acid, the lysosome that breaks down cell wall, nitric acid, another reactive chemical, also protolytic and hydrolytic enzymes are found in these lysosomes. Classic signs and symptoms of an inflammatory response. These are older terms, 
rhubar, color, tumor, dolor. Uh, you get redness. And you get swelling, pain, and heat at the site of inflammation. This is due to increased circulation. The blood vessels become enlarged. Fluid leaks out. Immune uh, cells are attracted to the site of the inflammation. Another sign of inflammation is loss of function. All signs of inflammation serve as a warning that injury is taking place. It sets in motion responses to save the body from further injury. <clears throat> Chief functions of inflammation are to mobilize and attract immune components to the site of the injury, to set motion mechanisms to repair tissue, localize and clear away harmful substances, and to destroy microbes and block their further invasion. So the major events in inflammation, so let's say you have a needle stick here and bacteria get into the site of the wound. First thing will happen, the mast cells, they'll release chemical mediators. One is histamine. It will result in greater vascular permeability. You will get a clot starts to form and, and not just for healing, but also to wall off other bacterial invasion. You will then get vasodilation, so you get greater circulation, you get the swelling, the edema, more immune cells, plasma, you know, seepage of plasma, and migration of white blood cells out of the vessels. This is called diapedesis, the movement of the white blood cells, phagocytic cells out to the site of the infection. The neutrophils are usually there first. Pus is just the accumulation of the dead cells with the cells that they phagocytized. You start getting the formation of fibers. Edema is just the swelling that is caused in the buildup of the fluids. And then you get eventually a resolution, healing, you know, fibrous tissue uh, replaces up here. You get clearing away of the debris. You get healing and repair that uh, goes on after the damage. Earliest changes in the vasculature occurs in the arterioles, the capillaries, and the venals. This is controlled by nervous stimulation, chemical mediators, and chemical messengers called cytokines. These are all released by blood cells, tissue cells, and platelets. Chemical actions of chemical mediators, they can be vasoactive. They can affect the endothelial cells and smooth the cells of blood vessels. They can attract other white blood cells to the site of the infection. Other mediators can cause fever, stimulate the lymphocytes, prevent virus spread, or they can cause allergic symptoms. Mediators and other cytokines I'll just refer to some of the uh, most important ones. Tumor necrosis factor released by macrophages lymphocytes. It increases chemotaxis, which is, is where um, cells move to the site of where a chemical is, taxis like a taxi, stimulates other cells to release inflammatory cytokines. Interferons, when when cells get infected with viruses, they release interferons. Interferons signal other cells to make anti 
viral proteins. One thing that happens, we don't quite know why people have had severe COVID infections, for some reason have antibodies against their own interferons. So it uh, supp actually suppresses this response. Uh, you have other mediators, prostaglandins produced by most cells of the body play a role in dilation or constriction of blood vessels, but they also are a powerful uh, stimulant of pain. Aspirin actually uh, inhibits the uh, molecules that lead to the production of prostaglandins. Histamines are very vasoactive, produced by mast cells, basophils, it causes vasodilation, in other words, the widening of the blood vessels. They cause increased vascular permeability. Mucus production, which also is what happens when you get allergic reactions. <clears throat> Serotonin causes the smooth muscles to contract, inhibits gastric secretion. And it's also a neurotransmitter. Bradykin, another vasoactive amine, stimulates smooth, uh, smooth muscle contraction, also results in vascular permeability, mucus production, and pain. It's particularly active in allergic reactions. And another interleukin involved in growth of T cells. So edema. We said is fluid buildup at the site of the inflammation and these various substances cause endothelial cells and post-capillary venules to contract and form gaps. <clears throat> Exudate is the blood-borne components that escape into the extracellular space during inflammation. And edema is the swelling and firmus due to the accumulation of the exudate into the tissue. Unique dynamic, I mentioned this before, white blood cells is diapedesis, their ability to migrate from within uh, endothelia system, squeeze through and get, and then the chemoattractic compounds like <clears throat> histamine, they gravitate toward that, which is at, at the site of the infection. The chemotaxis, chemicals that can attract immune cells to the site of the infection, secreted by uh, cells like the uh, mast cells and the basophils. The influx of fluid dilutes toxic substances at the site of the edema. Fibrogen clots can also help trap microbes, prevent further spread. Neutrophils carry out phagocytosis, destroy the bacteria, but they also clean out dead tissue and particulate matter. Pus is that whitest mass of uh, cells, liquid, liquefied cellular debris and bacteria. The late reactions of inflammation, you have some long lived inflammatory reactions to attract monocytes, lymphocytes, macrophages. The macrophages arrive later to the site of infection. They clear the pus, cellular debris, the dead neutrophils, and damaged tissue. The B cells react with foreign molecules and make antibodies. Specialized T cells kill intruders directly by secreting destructive chemicals. And eventually the tissue is repaired or replaced by a scar. Fever is an important part of our inflammatory response. It's fever is an abnormal elevated body temperature. It's a nearly universal symptom of infection. 
can also be associated with allergies, cancers, and other organic illnesses. A low-grade fever, if you're um, measuring it in Fahrenheit, is from 100 to 101, a moderate fever, 102 to 103. A high fever is 104 to 106. Now, pyrogens. Our hypothalamus in our brain is the thermostat that sets our body temperature. But exogenous pyrogens from outside our body, like viruses, bacteria, protozoans, fungi, the endotoxin, which is that toxin found in the LPS layer, gram-negative bacteria. Uh, these can uh, cause fever, but our body itself can release molecules, endogenous pyrogens. These are released by monocytes and neutrophils and macrophages. Two endogenous pyrogens, interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor can stimulate fever. Basically what they do is they get the hypothalamus to basically like a thermostat reset and our body temperature can go higher. The benefit of fever, it inhibits the multiplication of temperature sensitive microorganisms, impedes the nutrition of bacteria by reducing the availability of iron. It also increases our metabolism, stimulates immune reaction, and is naturally protective physiological processes. So there's in treatment of fever, some people feel that a slight to moderate fever in an otherwise healthy person should be allowed to run its course. There are benefits and minimal side effects. But all med medical experts agree a high fever and prolonged fevers are risky and should be treated. Fever also, you have to take consideration people have fevers. If people, if there's fever with people who have cardiovascular disease, head trauma, seizures, respiratory ailments, it should also be treated. Now, there's various antimicrobial proteins. I mentioned interferon. When a, a cell is infected with a virus, it will release interferon and stimulate other cells to make antiviral proteins. Interferon has now, we're able to make it. We can use it to treat viral infections like hepatitis and also cancer. It's involved in defenses against other microbes, immune regulation, and it's involved in intercellular communication. Interferon, however, is not virus specific. It's synthesized in response to one cell type. It'll protect other cells. So a cell gets infected with a virus, it makes the interferon and that signals the other cells to get ready and make antiviral proteins to protect the cell. Now, another antimicrobial protein is made by the liver. Uh, we used to say there were nine um, complement proteins. There, we now think there's about 30 of them. But these complement, these whole series of complement proteins, they work together to destroy bacteria and viruses by ca cascade reactions. So once one complement gets activated, it stimulates another one, another one, and results to uh, various responses. So we call this cascade reaction. So there's three pathways that can activate complement. The classical is when an antibody binds to, um, to a cell and binds complement. There's some uh, lectins found on bacteria that can activate complement. And also the LPS layer of gram-negative bacteria, the alternate pathway can activate complement. 
as does the cell wall, viruses, and even parasitic surfaces. So what are the three things that complement does? One is it forms this complement proteins join together and form a, what's called a membrane attack complex that can be in the envelope of an envelope virus or in a bacteria and causes the uh, cell, makes holes in the cell and causes them to lice. Other complement factors can stimulate inflammation and some of the original, the binding of the antibody and the complement can lead to increased phagocytosis. So in the classical two types of antibodies, IgG and IgM, the, um, they bind the first complement called C1 and That's the, the classical pathway, the lectin, sugars that are found on microbes can also activate complement. And the alternative pathway, which is slower and less efficient, involves a series of factors and recognition of uh, these things. All of these lead to formation of activating other complements to form what I said was that membrane attack complex. Here, this makes holes in the uh, microorganism or the envelope of enveloped viruses. So that's uh, <clears throat> complement. So another antimicrobial protein are these very small chains of amino acids, sometimes 12, maybe as many as 50. They grow by different names, defensins, bactericins. These are all part of the innate immune response. They have an effect on other actions of nonspecific and specific immunity. A common thing that we'll see in a lot of these uh, immune responses is something that will make like we have with complement the membrane attack complex. Here with these small antimicrobial proteins, they disrupt the cell membrane, they insert into the cell membrane and disrupt the cell membrane of bacteria. So the basic steps of phagocytosis, anybody remember that? It is recognition. Correct. And then they engulf them. Yes. It's the phagosome. The phag so the first thing you have is the formation of the phagosome, brings in the bacteria or virus into the phagocytic cell. Yes. And then the killing and destruction of the yeah, bacteria. Have, correct. So you have that other vesicle called a lysosome that has destructive chemicals and it will fuse with the phagosome and then break down the bacteria or the virus. Um, we mentioned the signs of inflammation. Do you remember what those are? Um, it was, uh, we, we have uh, swelling, pain, and swelling, uh, pain. You get the, uh, so you get the edema, the swelling, which is due to uh, fluids being exuded, increased circulation. Right. Uh, you get pain chemicals like prostaglandins. Uh, you get the um, <laughs> swelling, the edema, the pain, the redness, which is due to the increased circulation. You get the heat. Heat, yes. So that's due to the increased circulation at the site of inflammation. Right. Uh, and you get, you can get fever. 
Blank is the tendency of white blood cells to migrate in response to specific chemical stimulus. Is that chemotaxin? That's correct, that's chemotaxis. And so like histamine and other chemicals will help attract white blood cells to the site of the infection. So true or false, fever should always be treated. False. False, yeah, sometimes low-grade fever, uh, most instances they would uh, prefer to let it go because the fever itself will help uh, fight off the infection. So interferon is produced in response to infection by a what? Virus. So a cell gets infected with virus, it, it releases interferon, and that stimulates other cells to make antiviral proteins. Right. Okay, the three uh, pathways of complement activation, the classical pathway, I'll just go through it starts with uh, the C1 complement binding to antibody. There's the uh, lectin pathway, which uh, involves uh, detecting the presence of sugars on bacteria. The alternate pathway of various things like gram-negative bacteria, the fungal cell wall can activate it. The alternate pathway also involves a series of factors to activate the complement. And uh, it's the, the slowest uh, uh, of the three reactions. Oh, so that's the, uh, that's the end. And we finished um, a lot sooner than I thought. So are there uh, any questions? We, after tonight, we have two lectures and then we have our exam four. So does anybody have any questions about uh, the quiz at the beginning from chapter 13 or tonight's lecture? No, Professor. I, I do have um, to say something. The quizzes in the beginning really, really helps. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to uh, keep doing that. Uh, maybe um, the lecture go a little quicker than I thought. Maybe I can, maybe we can expand upon that. Maybe uh, either do a longer quiz or maybe do uh, another quiz at the end. You think that would be helpful? Yes. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you never know what you know. You actually take a test. Right, that's it's true. It's quite true. It's a good point. All right, well, let's do that. We only have two lectures left. Uh, I wanted to be able to have plenty of time for these lectures, and it went a little quicker than I thought. So we could do a a, uh, a quiz at the beginning and a quiz at the end uh, next week. But if there's any questions that you have, we we've talked about various immune cells. So both we've talked, we haven't really gone, next week we'll go into the more detail about the adaptive immune response and the B cells and the T cells. We'll talk about, there's five different kinds of antibodies. We'll talk a little bit about antibody structure. Um, so any other questions about tonight? You know how you do the study guides with slides to look at? Will yes. you do that for the exam? Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I will do that for this test too. Okay. That Thank will... you. All right, everybody. I um, I think that's it for this evening. And I will... Uh, Hopefully I can uh, put the video of this into the module. Uh, they've given me more uh, memory. 
to store these. So we just, have, there's also, I hope I have enough room. I have a couple of short videos about immunology and I'll create a folder and put those videos in. Hopefully it'll let me do that. You can just view these short little videos. You'll see when, when I get it up there that uh, just show you some of these things, but they show it in a video form, a little cartoon form. And so it's kind of a little easier to understand it when you can visualize it. Right. Well, okay. thank you. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Everybody, remember what I said at the beginning, remain vigilant. Hopefully we're going to um, have a vaccine soon maybe even the beginning of this year, though, um, the most vulnerable people should get the vaccine first and also the frontline workers and so on. But I think there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And we also need a competent administrator, uh, administration in the White House to manage it all. And hopefully that's coming soon. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank good you, night. sir. Good night. Thank you. Okay, good night. Anybody else? Okay, I'm going to end the uh, session. Good night, everybody. Good night.